how to create async action blueprint nodes with C++ in Unreal. Because even though a delay is pretty fun, a delay that does something is even better. Um, actually, I feel like I already said that before. Uh, oh yeah, there are two main ways to create a latent blueprint node. There is the latent action that we saw in the previous video and also the blueprint async action that we're going to see today. So we're going to compare them both and see which one works best. So let's get to it. And here we are in our header file, but before we jump in the code, we're going to take a quick look at all the upsides and downsides I found when comparing the latent action with the blueprint async action that we're going to do today. So these are my upsides and downsides. Obviously, depending on your situation, maybe some upsides might be considered downsides and vice versa. It depends what you need. But in my case, my upsides are that first we have a direct output execution pin in our blueprint node, which means that if the latent action fails to be created, it's still going to trigger an execution pin after calling the blueprint print node, which was not a thing for the pending latent action. If we fail to create a latent action in the previous video, the function call will just stop the blueprint execution flow right away. You will not be able to run any other blueprint node after this call. So that's a big upside in my opinion. Then you have an actual object that you can use in blueprint after calling this blueprint node. So when creating a new blueprint async action, it's going to create a new object for you. And then you have that object that you can reuse anywhere else in the blueprint to access the variables, to call some function, to do anything else with it. So that could be pretty useful depending on the situation. And finally, it's also possible to trigger the execution pin at any point in the code. You don't have to wait the end of the update like in the pending latent action. You can simply call the execution pin and it's going to be called as soon as you need it. And that's really awesome actually because you can really have control over the execution flow of your code and that's pretty awesome. Um, then you have some downsides though. Every time this function is called, it's going to create a new object. That object right here, it's an upside that you have an object, but every time you call the function, it's going to create a new object, a new instance. So you really have to keep track of which instance you're using right now. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a bunch of weird random bugs here and there. So yeah. You have to keep track of that. And actually related to that, you cannot easily get the running instance if there's one. So when you call the blueprint node, it's just going to create a new instance for you, but you don't have a way to retrieve the currently running instance, not without creating any custom logic on your side, which is totally possible, but that's not something we're gonna do today. So today we're gonna have to deal with the fact that we're just creating an object. The object is running. You cannot really access it easily. And that's it. We just have to deal with it. And actually related to that, you cannot really add extra input pins to your function to affect the current action. For example, you cannot cancel your action by calling the same blueprint node. You cannot have like multiple execution pin, one to start, one to cancel, one to update or modify the current action. You cannot do that. You can only have one input execution pin and that's just going to start the action. Once the action is started, you can still cancel it if you want to, but you have to go through the blueprint object that was created. So it's going to create an object and then you can use that object to call the cancel function. You cannot just call the blueprint node one more time to cancel the action because you don't have access to that running object actually. So you don't know which object you want to cancel. And finally, the last note is that you don't have any control to when the object is going to be destroyed. You can flag Unreal that the object is ready to be destroyed. So your timer is done, your task is done, your action is done. You just want to destroy the object. You don't need it anymore. So Unreal, please destroy that object. Unreal is going to destroy it one day in the future. Yeah. So that can either be really annoying depending on the situation or you just don't care about it. That's just something you have to deal with if you want to use this system. You just have to keep in mind that your objects are still alive until they are destroyed, which can happen anytime in the future. Okay, so these were the upsides and downsides. And finally, I have some additional notes. The code today is going to be way simpler than the previous video. It's just how the system is. It's super simple compared to the previous one. And finally, there's one little requirement when creating your code. The class that you're going to create, so the blueprint async action that you're going to create right here, must have at least one static function returning the pointer of the class. So that's going to be the blueprint node we're going to create. So when using that class, Unreal is going to try to find a function that returns a pointer to that class, so a pointer of your class right here, and that cannot be done outside the, the class. That has to be inside the class, which means that you cannot just place your function in a function library, for example. You have to place it inside the async action you're going to create. There's no way around it, that's just how it works. It doesn't really matter, actually, it works the same way as if the function was in the function library, but it's just a weird little requirement. But anyway, 
Okay, that's it for the notes and now we can finally jump in the code and the first thing that we're gonna need is two little include right here at the top. We need the delegate combinations because that's how we're going to create the execution pins on our blueprint node. So we need that include to be able to do that and then we also need the blueprint async action base obviously because we want to create a child of that class. Those two includes are inside the core and engine module so we're just going to make sure that both of those are already inside the build.cs file or add them if they are not. I have my core module right here and I have my engine module right there. Perfect, I'm ready to go. If you don't have them, make sure to add them, obviously. But anyway, I'm just going to go back in my header file and now we can start looking at the logic. So I'm going to scroll down all the way under my notes right here. And as you can see, I already created my class. So my class is going to be uAsync account seconds and it's going to be a child of uBlueprint async action base. That's the parent class of all the async actions in the engine. So that's the parent and then you can just create your own class under it. In my case, I named it account seconds because that's what we're going to do. We're going to do the exact same thing that we did in the previous video so we're just going to create a simple blueprint function that counts the seconds and update the user every x amount of seconds so super simple and i really wanted to create the same exact logic so we can easily compare both techniques here we go so i have my class right here on top of the class make sure that it is a blueprint type if you want to be able to access that function via blueprint you need blueprint type right here and then you also need a little meta right here the expose the async proxy equal async action meta that's just just how it works uh, this class requires to have that meta so make sure to add it otherwise it's just not going to work so make sure you have the meta and then your class is ready to be used here we go I have my class before adding stuff in the class though we're gonna need another thing so I'm just going to create it right here we're gonna need a delegate so declare dynamic multicast delegate and then you name your delegate so in my case it's going to be fasync account seconds output pins because we're going to use that delegate to create all the different output pins we want to create on our function if you want five six seven output pins you're gonna have to do it using that delegate right here so declare dynamic multicast delegate and then the name of your your delegate there we go that's it that's all we needed and actually i don't know why my visual studio is complaining about the macro but whatever just ignore that uh, let's say that it worked perfect so i have my delegate and i have my class now that i have both of those i can finally create my function here we go i have my function right here as i said at the beginning of the video this function has to be a little bit different it needs to return a pointer to that class so here i'm going to create a function that returns a uasync account second pointer because that's my class right here that we're going to create so this function the async account seconds that's the function you're going to call in blueprint that's going to be its name but that function is not going to do anything it's actually just going to create an instance of that class and return it to the user and that's it the logic is going to be done elsewhere this function right here is really just to create an instance of that class and make sure that it is static so you're able to call it from anywhere obviously and then you can also provide all the arguments that you need inside this function so in my case I'm gonna need the world context uh, which we're going to initialize the same way we do usually so world context is equal to world context uh, that's the name of my variable that I have right here and I'm going to assign it inside the world context property and then I'm also going to add all the other variables that I'm gonna need to do my logic so in my case since I want to count seconds I want to first know at which interval I have to notify the user while counting my seconds so that's going to be my interval right here and then the final time when I should stop counting the seconds because I don't want to continue counting seconds forever I want to stop at some point so that's going to be the final time that I have right here and if you've seen the last video you're probably noticing that I have way less variables right here compared to the previous one and that's simply because I don't need to provide everything inside this function because then that function is going to return us an object and then everything else can be accessed directly from that object and we're going to create the variables on the side a little bit later so we're going to have an instance of that class we're gonna have an object and from that object you'll be able to know the current time the status of the action uh, if it's failed or not and things like that so everything's gonna be saved directly inside the object you don't have to provide it to the function as reference for example here we go my function is created and it's fairly simple one last thing though just make sure that you have the blueprint internal use only equal to true right here that's going to tell unreal to treat this function a little bit differently than all the other functions and based on the context unreal is going to do some 
something specific with that function. In our case, since it's going to be an async action function, Unreal is going to create a latent node for us with the little timer icon, and it's also going to add all the output pins that we need based on the delegate that we created at the top. So if you want the function to be processed and generated properly, you need the blueprint in the null use only equal to true right here. Good, I have my function, but I still don't have the output execution pin. And to create those, well, it's super simple. You just have to create variables using the delegate you created at the top right here. So the fa sync count seconds output pin delegate. From that delegate, I'm going to create four variables because I want four output pins. I want the unupdated, that's going to be called every time the timer is updated, the uncancelled every time the timer is cancelled, which should be only once actually, and the uncompleted when the timer is completed, and unfailed in case that the action failed. And as I said before, I don't know why my Visual Studio doesn't find my delegate right here. It should find it and just ignore the red lines. It should work. Good. Make sure that all those output pins are flagged as blueprint assignable so you can assign them in blueprint, obviously. And that's it. Now you have a function and that function has four output pins. There's just one thing that's missing and it is the function that's going to execute the logic of your action. Because this function right here is just going to create an instance of your object and return it to the user and start that instance. But when starting that instance, you want it to run some logic and that logic has to be inside the activate function right here. That activate function is inside the parent. So inside this class right here, you have a function that is called activate and it's a virtual function. So virtual void activate and we want to override it to be able to implement our own logic. In our case, I want to be able to count seconds. And that's what I'm going to do using the activate right here. We cannot start the logic inside the async count second. That's just to create the instance. Then the activate is really to run the logic. Perfect. So Everything here is what's needed to create an async action blueprint node. If you want to create your own async action, you probably want to modify the variables that are received as input and also the output pins, but you absolutely need to have a function that returns a pointer to that class and also to override the activate right here. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And as for everything else that is related to my specific code, we're going to do that right after. Because in my case, I want to use this action to count seconds. And that's maybe not something that you want to do. So that's why I wanted separate what's required and what I need for my specific case today. So that's what's required. And then if I scroll down all the way down right here, I'm going to add all the variables that I'm going to need for my specific logic. So to create my timer, I'm going to need, well, first the timer interval that I receive as input. I want to save it somewhere. So a float timer interval right here. Another float, the timer final time to remember when I should stop my timer. Then I want to have another float to know which time I'm currently at right now. So timer current time. And then I'm going to have a Boolean to let the user know if the action is a success or not. And finally, an information message to give more information to the user in the case that the action failed or is progressing. These are all the variables that I'm going to need to execute my logic. And I'm also going to need another function right here, the cancel count seconds, because it's not possible to cancel the action directly on the node. It's not possible to add an extra execution pin as input to cancel our action. That's why I'm going to create the cancel count seconds function directly on my object. I still have my object and it's going to work like any other object in Unreal. You can call functions on it. So that's why right here I'm creating my little function, avoid the cancel count second. I made sure that it is a blueprint callable function so I can call it from anywhere in blueprint. And that's it. When creating my action, I'm going to create an object and then I can use that object to cancel my action if I need to. That's pretty much everything public I needed for my action, but I also need some extra private function that we're going to use internally to handle the timer and everything. So in my private category right here, I have my update account seconds. That's going to be the function called every X amount of time. And we're going to use that function to notify the user that the timer was updated. Then we also have the finish count seconds. That's going to be the function we're going to use to clean the action once the logic is completed. So if the user cancel the action or if the countdown is completed, that this function is going to flag the object as ready to be destroyed and it's going to clean all the variables and make sure everything is cleaned up properly. And since we want to be able to call this same logic in multiple places, that's why I wrapped it inside a little function. And finally, I also need three little variables right here to be able to do my logic. So I need the world context object, I need the world, and I also need a timer handle to be able to create my timer. And that's it. Okay. So everything right here is very specific to what I want to do. In your case, if you want to do something different, 
different, all those variables and functions are probably going to be different, obviously. Perfect. So that's it for the other file. Now it's time to jump in the CPP. And we're going to start with the includes, and we have three of them today. So we have the engine.h to be able to retrieve the world from the context object. Then we're going to need the world to be able to start the timer. So I'm going to include my world.h right here. And finally, I'm also going to include editor engine.h. That's something I forgot in the previous video. So if your code in the previous video didn't compile, it's probably because of that. It's because I'm using the editor engine, so the G editor, to retrieve the world that is currently open in the editor in the case that the world context object is not valid. In my case, since I'm not in game, I don't always have access to a world or a world context object. So sometimes the world context object is not valid, which means that I can use the editor to obtain the world that is currently open instead of using the world that is in game because I'm not in game. So this is just for my test today. You don't need to include that. So don't worry. You can use those functions in game. No problem. But in my case, I'm going to use it. So I'm going to need engine, engine and Unreal ED. Let's go make sure that they are in the build.cs file. I have my engine right here and I have my Unreal ED all the way down there. Perfect. I have all the modules I need. Now I can go back in the CPP. If you're missing some, you can just add them, obviously. Good. So now we're back in the CPP and it's time to take a look at the first function, the ASIC count seconds function. That's the function that the user is going to call in Blueprint. And actually that function is not going to run the logic itself. It's just going to create an instance of the action. And then that instance is going to run the logic later on. Uh, in my case, my instance, I named it the Blueprint node because it made sense in my head. I'm calling the Blueprint node. It's creating an instance of itself. And then I'm using that instance to trigger my action. But even though actually I'm just creating an instance of the action. So don't worry about that. I'm just creating a new instance of my action, the uAsync account seconds. I'm putting it into this little variable right here and there it is I have my pointer to my action now that I have my action I can provide it all the variables that I receive as input so I have the world context that is all the way down here so group and node the world context objects equal to world context I have my interval that I'm setting inside timer intervals right here uh, right here I'm doing a max just to make sure that the timer interval is not smaller than 0.001f otherwise it would make a timer of zero second and it will break the system a little bit so I'm just making sure that my timer is not equal to zero. And then final time, I'm just putting that variable inside timer final time, just so the timer knows when it has to stop, obviously. Good. I created an instance of my action. I've set all the variables and now I can simply return my instance right here. That's it. That's all the function needs to do. It doesn't do any logic. It just creates the instance for you. And then later on, Unreal is going to call the activate on that new instance. So that's where the logic is going to happen inside the activate function right here. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And to do the logic. In my case, I want to trigger a timer. So let's just do that. To be able to create a timer, I'm going to need the world because the time manager is inside the world. So here I'm going to retrieve the world using the context object we receive as input. So G engine get world from context object. The context object is going to be the world context object variable that we have on that instance. And then if I didn't find a world using that context object, I'm just going to return null and that world will be null in the case that the context object is not valid. If the context object is valid and is inside the proper world, that variable world is going to be valid, obviously. Good. Now I have a world, but it's possible that it's not valid, as I said. So here in the case that the world is not valid. So world is equal to null and also the time inside the editor. So if G editor is not equal to null, then I can retrieve the world that is currently open in the editor. And that's what I'm doing right here. G editor, get editor world context, get world. And then that's going to give me the world currently open in the editor. And that's, that's how I retrieve the world from the editor when I'm not in game. If your code is only meant to be used in game, you only need this line right here, you don't need this little part right there. But it's still possible that the world is not valid. And in that case, I'm just going to return right away because I don't want to do any logic for my timer. I don't want to start a timer. Actually, I can't because I don't have a world. But since I can't, I'm just going to return. I'm not going to try to start a timer. So if the world is equal to null, then I'm just going to say that my action was not a success. I was not able to create my timer because the world is not valid. And when that happens, I'm also going to trigger the unfailed pin. So my Delegate on failed right here. I'm going to broadcast it and that's going to fire the unfailed execution pin that is going to be on the blueprint node so the user can react when the timer failed to be created. I'm going to set the state of my action. I'm going to trigger the proper execution pin and then I'm also going to finish my action. So finish count seconds. That function is just going to clean up the action as I said before. So I'm going to clean everything that needed to be cleaned and then I'm going to destroy my action because I don't need it anymore. Obviously, because well, like 
cannot run the timer and that was the only purpose of this action. Perfect. So I'm going to set the state, trigger the proper pin, it complete my action and that's it. I'm just going to return. I'm done because I cannot do anything with this action in the case that I don't have a world. Perfect. So now we handle the situation in which we don't have a valid world. But if we have a valid world, then it's time to start the timer. And that's what I'm going to do right here in the world. I have access to the time manager. So get timer manager and then I can do a set the timer to start a timer. For that timer, I'm going to provide the timer handle, which is the variable that I have in my action, so timer handle. Then I have to tell my timer which function should be called when the timer is triggered. Then in my case, it's going to be a function on this object, so on this instance. And the function that we want to call is update account second, which is the function that I have right here. So that function is going to be called every interval of my timer. The timer interval is the variable I received as input, so timer intervals are right here. Then I have a boolean to tell my timer if we want it to loop or not. In my case, I want to loop. I want it to continue over and over and over until we finish the counting the seconds. And finally, the minus one right here represent the delay of the first iteration of the timer. In my case, I don't want the delay. I want it to trigger right away. So I'm just going to put it to minus one and the timer is going to start as soon as we trigger it. Perfect. Now the timer is started and it's going to call update count seconds every X amount of time. And it's inside that function that we're going to do the rest of the logic. We're going to increment the seconds and notify the user when the timer is updated. So we're going to do that right here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And inside update count seconds, it's super simple. We have to first update the timer. So timer current time plus equal timer interval. So we're going to increment it every interval. And once that's done, we can notify the user that the timer was updated. So trigger the pin on updated. So broadcast that pin. That's going to fire the blueprint code. And once the blueprint code is run, we can check if the timer was completed actually, because now we just updated the timer and it now has a new time. Is that new time bigger or equal than the final time that we wanted to compare with? So timer current time bigger or equal than a final time. If it's true, well, it means that the timer is completed. We counted all the seconds we needed to count until the final time. And that's what I'm going to say right here. I'm going to say that it was a success. My action is completed. We counted all the seconds we needed to count. And then I'm going to fire the uncompleted execution pin. So uncompleted dot broadcast is going to fire that execution pin. And once that's done, we're done with this action. The action is done working. We did everything we needed to do in this action. So I'm just going to finish my count seconds right here. So it's going to clean up everything, stop the timer and destroy the object after everything is done. Perfect. So that was for the update count seconds. And now we just have the two last little function right here and they are pretty quick. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. When we want to finish the work, we're going to want to check if the timer is valid. So if my timer end all is valid and my world is not equal to null, it probably means that I have a timer currently running in the time manager in the world. And if it's the case, I want to invalidate that timer. I want the timer to stop running because we don't want to have a random timer running in the world for no reason. So in the world, I'm going to get the timer manager again. I'm going to clear a timer and the timer I'm going to clear is the timer end all, obviously. So this is just going to stop the timer that is currently running in the world the time manager. And then I can also invalidate my end all so I don't try to cancel it again and again and again for no reason. The timer is cleared once. We don't need to clear it more times. So I'm just going to invalidate my timer and all. Perfect. That's done. The timer is canceled. Good. The last thing that we need to do when we want to finish our actions is to actually tell Unreal that the action is ready to be destroyed. So set ready to destroy. That's a function in the parent of the action. So all the actions need to call that function once they are done working. You have to call this action. If you don't, Unreal is never going to destroy your action. You're just going to have an object floating around in space forever. And that's not good. Make sure to always call set ready to destroy as soon as you're done working with that action. The action's task is completed. The action was canceled. The action failed to run for some reason. Call the set ready to destroy. And that's why I wrapped those two steps inside a little function because I want to make sure to always clear the timer and always call set ready to destroy when I'm done working with that action. Good. Okay, the action is cleaned up properly and it's going to be destroyed. It says uh, set ready to destroy because Unreal is just going to destroy it later. It's not going to destroy it right away. It's just going to destroy it on the next garbage collection call. Here we go. That's it for the finish count seconds. And now we have the last one, cancel count seconds. And that one is super simple. We can see that it was a success. It was canceled by the user. And then I can broadcast the uncancel the pin. So uncancel the broadcast. That's going to fire the blueprint code. And finally, I can call my finish count seconds just to make sure that the action is cleaned up properly and the object is destroyed. And that's it. Now it's time to jump in Unreal to see if it works.
And here we are in Unreal, and today we don't need a scene because everything is going to be inside the user interface that I have right here. And actually, yep, it's the same as the previous video because that was the objective, to be able to recreate the same exact logic with two different techniques. So today it's going to be the async action the blueprint node user interface, which is similar as the previous one. So I have my interval right here. So at which interval we want to update the timer. We have the slider for the final time, so we can decide when is the final time of our timer, a little number that is going to display the current time of our timer, a button to start the timer, a button to cancel the timer, and finally a button to increase manually the timer. And when we click on those buttons, it's going to feed the information directly to our timer, just like yeah. Okay, the blueprint in this video is way more complicated than the one from the previous video. Yeah, and that's because the async action count a second right here doesn't do as much as the latent action. In that node, we cannot manage the current action that is currently running, and that's mainly what caused all of that. Because I might have an action that is currently running, and I don't want to spawn a bunch of different instances of the same action. I want to cancel the previous one before creating a new one. But anyway, let's go through all the steps together. I have my function right here, async count seconds. That's good. That's exactly the function we created. It's a latent function. Perfect. We have the little timer right here in the top right corner, and we can provide the variables that we wanted to provide. So the interval from my user interface and also the final time, same thing from the user interface. So the node knows what interval it should update the timer and also the final time of that timer. When that node is called, it's going to first create the action that I'm going to promote into a variable because I want to keep track of the current action. And that's going to be the action I'm going to use to retrieve the current time or to cancel the action if I want to. So I'm going to promote it into a new variable that I have right here on the left. I have my new variable. And then we have the thing that I like the most about this technique is that we have a little execution pin right here, a default execution pin. So even if we were not able to create the async action, the blueprint code will not stop right here. It will continue using that execution pin. That was not the case with the latent action. The latent action will just stop right here, and that's not fun. So instead here, what we can do is check if the action is valid and do something in that case. But in our case, I'm just going to always assume that the action is valid, and that's it. The node is just going to create the action for you and then execute the rest of the flow afterwards. On top of that, we have all the other execution pins that we created. So the unupdated, uncancelled, uncompleted, and also unfailed, all the broadcast event dispatcher that we created. Here they are. And that's just going to be used to update the user interface. In my case, if I just received the unupdated, I'm just going to update my timer in my user interface. So I'm going to set my text using the current time of my action. But if instead I received the uncancelled, completed, or failed, I'm just going to update the user interface with the information that my action contains and I'm also going to clear my variable because the action is completed. The action should be destroyed in the near future so I also want to cancel my variable right here because I don't need to keep track of that variable anymore because it's cancelled or completed. Perfect. That was for when we call this node right here. But every time we call this node, it's going to automatically create a new instance of the action for you every time. So if you call it 10 times, it's going to create 10 instances, 20 times, 20, 40, 40 instances. That can be a lot. And it's possible that your previous instances are still running. Then you can decide if you want to let them run and continue receiving the events for all those functions. Or maybe you want to cancel the previous action before creating a new instance. And that's my case. I want to be able to cancel the previous action before creating a new instance. That way, even if I spam the start button, it's always going to cancel the previous action and then create a new one. And when I click on that, it's going to cancel the current action, which is the little piece of code that I have right here. So cancel current action is going to check if the current action is valid. If it is, I'm going to call cancel count seconds. As simple as that. That's the function we created in C++ to be able to cancel the action at any point. I'm also going to do the same thing when I click on the button cancel timer because that's pretty much the same logic actually. And I'm also going to do the same thing when the widget is getting destroyed because when the widget is destroyed, it's also possible that the action is not completed. It's still counting the seconds. It's still running in the background. And if your final time is crazy high, so let's say two hours, three hours, the timer is still going to run for another two hours and maybe you 
don't need that timer to run. It's just going to run for no reason. There's no widget to update. There's nobody that is going to receive the event. It's just a running timer for no reason. And you don't want that. You want to cancel the timer in the case that the object that created the timer is destroyed. In my case, I'm checking for the current widget, but if you spawned it with another blueprint actor, that actor can be destroyed. And then you probably also want to destroy the timer. You don't want to let it run for no reason. So here, that's what I'm doing. Event destroy. So when my widget is destroyed, if I have an action running, I'm just going to cancel it before destroying the widget. As simple as that. And the last piece of code that we have right here is when we click on the manual increase button, it's going to check if my action is valid because if it's not, I cannot increment a random value on an action that doesn't exist. That will not make sense. And then since the variable are already accessible in Blueprint, I can simply modify them right here. So in my action, I have access to the current time. I can do a plus one on that current time. Why not? And then set my timer using the new value that I want to assign to that timer. And that's it. That's as simple as that. The variables are accessible in Blueprint, so you can simply set the variable. Hey, that makes sense. And after that, obviously, I'm updating the user interface because I want it to be updated as soon as I click on the button. Perfect. That, I think, pretty much covers everything that we have in the Blueprint right here. As I said, most of the logic comes from the fact that we cannot manage the current action directly inside the Blueprint node. We have to add extra logic around it to manage the current action. But you can see it in a way that, well, you have more control over the things, and maybe that's what you want. Perfect. Okay, let's see how it runs. Now I'm going to run my editor utility widget. It's going to open my little timer right here at the bottom. And I'm also going to select it right here at the top so we can see what happens when we click on the button. So I'm going to select my current widget. There uh, we go. And then if I start my timer, it's going to start the timer, update the user interface, and then it's going to update my text every time the timer is updated. Once the timer is completed, it's going to update my user interface again to say that my async count second was a success and it's completed. And then I'm also going to clear my variable because I don't need it afterwards. I'm going to start again to see what happens. I'm trying to cancel the previous timer, but I didn't have one, so it didn't cancel anything. If I start again, now it's going to cancel the previous timer. Start again, cancel, start again, cancel. So it's always canceling the previous timer before starting a new one. And then it's updating all the way until the end. And once it's done, it's just going to say that it's a success and it's completed. Perfect. It seems to work. I can click on cancel. Uh, it doesn't do anything because I don't have an action running. I'm going to start an action and then cancel it. There we go. I was able to cancel my action and it said that it was success it was cancelled by a user so that works i can change my interval right here so make them a little bit smaller there we go my timer updates faster i can increase the last value so the final time right here do, 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 do. it's going to take more time to reach that final time obviously do, 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 do. it gets to the end there we go it's completed and finally we can manually increase the timer right now i can't because i don't have a timer running but if i start a new timer i can increase it manually and here we go i reach the end and you can see that the final time right here is actually higher than the max time. It's because, well, first, the final time cannot be divided properly by the interval. And that's why I have a bigger amount right here. But if, let's say, I spam my timer super fast right here, I'm going to go way above the limit because I'm able to actually spam a bunch of times in between the different updates. Actually, I'm not that fast. If I do that, here we go. I can go way above the limit before the next update is called because my intervals are too long. That's something you have to manage on your side if you don't want the user to be able to go way above the timer value because right now I can spam it as fast as I can and it's going to go faster than the current time. There we go. Perfect. Okay, I guess that covers everything. Oh yeah, no, the destruct, uh, we forgot that. I'm going to start a new timer. And now if I close uh, this little widget right here, it's going to cancel my timer and that's it. It's going to make sure that the timer is destroyed because, well, the widget doesn't exist. So the timer doesn't exist either. So if I start my timer, stop again, it's going to start the timer before closing the widget. And that's it. Now you know how to create an async action with C++. And that's going to be it for today's video. So I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Uh,